Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so it's a pleasure to have um, Hamid Navid speaking today. Uh, Mohamed is a PhD student at uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and uh, where he works on uh, security and crypto. And uh, today he'll be uh, giving a talk about uh, a new paper of his um, on searchable encryption. Thank you, Sani. <laughs> so uh, I'll talk about uh, our work on this uh, blind storage and how we can use the blind storage to create a searchable encryption scheme. This is joint work with my advisors, uh, both from University of Illinois. And <laughs> so, in, in April 2013, Amazon S3 reached uh, like the total number of objects stored in Amazon S3 reached 2 trillion. And each object in Amazon S3 is like from 1 byte to 5 terabytes. So it's like a huge amount of data that is being stored. And this, like, uh, this reasonably says that people are using uh, cloud storage services to store large amount of data. And another is just like how many students are using it. So this was like Dropbox has a promotion offer a couple of years back. And if a particular number of students enroll in this, and then everybody gets 20 gigabyte free storage. So if you can see like thousands of students enrolled in it. Like just from University of Illinois, 7,000 students enrolled in it. So like a lot of people are using cloud storage services. And recently, uh, Google Drive reduces the prices to just like $2 per month for 100 gigabytes. And 15 gigabytes is just free. So people will use it more and more because the prices, the prices are also decreasing. And just like another way to look at the popularity is if you just do a Google search for public cloud storage, it retrieves almost 350 million records. Uh, search results. And then if you do it for the privacy, it like something like 94 million. And f same with like security issues, it's like 184 million. So people are worried about security and privacy issues. <coughs> so now this is like a funny story how like people think about uh, cloud storage. So there is this video I uh, on YouTube I'm sure you don't want to see it, you know what cloud computing is, but the comments on this video were very interesting. So this first guy says that if you want to, uh, if you value your security and privacy, you don't need to use cloud. This other guy just replied, and this is all on YouTube. This other guy replied that banks are using it and you use banks, so it's secure. I mean, why are you worry about this? This other guy comes in and he's very pessimistic. He says that, it is like a massive form of always online DRM, and they can take all, uh, all our privacy if data is stored on, on the cloud. And this other guy says that even hard stuff, like he's saying, once our data is stored on the cloud, authority can just deny us from accessing our data, and then they can take control of all of our data. And this other guy, this is saying that you can just have two to three local drives and then you just store everything locally. You just back up. And he's saying there is no way that all three can fail at the same time. This other guy replied that this all three cannot fail at the same time, but they can m burn, melt, or they can damage, or they can disappear if someone stole it. So, and then there is other guy This is saying that, I mean, he just says even more reasons. And the, what's funny about it is that if you want real security, you can just ship your hard disk to, to your parents every couple of months. <laughs> just like a, so people have like different opinions about this. This is just like a funny story on YouTube. So now I'll talk about like just uh, storage outsourcing. So first, how the uh, our storage looks like now when we store like in on our own premises. So they're like user and he has direct access to the infrastructure, storage infrastructure. Users can do whatever they want. They can write, read, delete, search, and they can do pretty much everything. 
and they don't have to worry about any security and privacy because it's every, everything is in the in premises. Now, when you move to the cloud, then the client stores all the files to the cloud. But now, and the cloud can be any company, and but now they have access to your data. So that worries some people. So, uh, and the problem is that this user can be hospital, and these records can be electronic health records, and that's then it's even a serious concern. And it's not even that this hospital might want some privacy. It's like a law. They need to do it in a special way. Like they need to encrypt it and do it in a set special way. So HIPAA is a law that guarantees like you cannot store unencrypted data or like identifiable data on the cloud. Yes? How is unencrypted, how is encrypted defined? I believe in California, ROT 13 is enough to get you off the legal hook. Yes, that's true. Yeah, I'm just like, uh, that's what you, if you just encrypt data and store it in the cloud, it satisfies HIPAA. Yeah. <clears throat> but still, it leaks a lot of information. So maybe in future, they regulate that also. So the, another problem is like, for example, University of Illinois, a few years back, they moved from Gmail to now, now they maintain their own uh, my exchange server for email. And it is just available for graduate students and faculty. And they are just worried about that Google might be seeing our research and this type of issues. So a naive encryption scheme, if you just encrypt all your documents and store it in the cloud, this does not work because you can see that some files are bigger, some smaller. Like this shows that the size of the files are leaked. And, and the other major issue is that you cannot now search over this data. So, and if you, if you want to uh, hide the file size, you can just, just combine all your files, encrypt it, and store it in the cloud. But still, the search problem is there. But now it's even worse. You need to download everything. So now, if you want to search with this naive strategy, the only option is you just get back all of your data. You decrypt it, and then you search locally. So here, the problem begins with that, like, the only reason that you outsource the data was that you were not able to handle it. I mean, that's why you outsource. So you don't have enough resources to handle it, so you outsource it. So you cannot get it back all, all, all your data. So that's not a, that will not work. There are many other trivial solutions, like with local storage, you store index locally and things like that. But that also does not work, because index is comparable size to the data itself. So can we do better? So yeah, and the answer is yes, and there are different ways we can do it. Uh, we can use property preserving encryption, functional encryption, fully homomorphic encryption, ORAM, and searchable encryption. So some of them are less secure, some are more, and some are inefficient. But uh, yeah, we believe that uh, a good approach is using searchable encryption which provides good trade-off between, per, between performance and security and privacy. So for the remaining of talk, I'll talk about searchable encryption. So how searchable encryption works is that like searchable encryption have two phases. In the first phase, the client has a set of documents that it wants to upload to the cloud, but it wants to have the capability to search over this data. And without telling the server, <laughs> Uh, the content of the files. So it just creates an inverted index of the documents. Then it just encrypts the file using simple ES, like simple encryption scheme. And it encrypts the index using searchable, searchable encryption scheme. Send the, sends, it sends the documents to the server and the index also to the server. So this is the setup phase. After that, now client want to search for, for like for some keyword like Illinois, then it will create an encrypted token and send it to the cloud. Now the cloud from this encrypted token, cloud, uh, the cloud will look into this encrypted index. And from it, using some procedure, it will figure out that these two files are required and it will get back these files to the client. And the client can then decrypt the files locally and read. 
this is just the high level idea what what searchable encryption does and now if you want to add a document like you have this document what you do is you create you first extract all the keywords you encrypt the file using simple encryption scheme you encrypt you encrypt the keywords in a clever scheme using searchable encryption scheme and you send the document encrypted and then you send this to the cloud and then the cloud will somehow update the index to reflect that so now later if you retrieve it it will in you will you will get this new file also uh, same procedure for delete also you just you will just delete the index from the index file there is some leakage to the server in this process and what's being leaked here is the first is the access pattern that is which documents contain a keyword like if two co if two documents contain same keyword that this fact is leaked to the server when you search and the other things that that is leak is the search pattern like if you search for this keyword once and then the, and then later you searched again and the, you you search for the same keyword the server knows the fact that you are searching for the same keyword again and this is uh, for the search add addition leaks a lot of information in most of the prior schemes and including ours it leaks is it leaks the hashes of all the keywords that are present in the new document And delete, actually in the prior best scheme, it leaks the hashes of all the keywords in the deleted do document, plus it leaks some more information about other files that are not even deleted. So leak during updates is more than uh, during search. So there is a lot of prior work in this area and most of the schemes are not parallelizable. And uh, almost all uh, the schemes require server-side computation, like you need some computation to be done on the server and you need some storage on the server. And uh, as I explained earlier, it's, uh, uh, the leakage is much more during updates. And yes. So only during updates, not initial. So this access pattern, yes. Like the hashes of all the keywords, um, when you initially send the index, you don't leak Yes, you don't leak that. Yeah, but as you search, then you leak some information. You, you leak the access, access pattern and search pattern. <coughs> yeah, so slowly it reveals information. And uh, 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 most of the prior schemes are very complicated schemes. And if they uh, want to make it dynamic, then it makes that, then uh, they becomes even more complicated. So, uh, Link list based schemes. So most of the uh, uh, SSE schemes, searchable encryption schemes, uses a link list based approach. So the, the basic approach is something like this. So the node of the link list looks like something like this. That it has three components. One is a document ID. It has a key that is used to decrypt the next node of the link list, and it has a pointer to the next node. So for every keyword, what you do is you create this link list. And, uh, and each node of this linked list contains one of these document IDs that contain the keyword. And then you encrypt the first node with a special key that is stored in a different data structure. And you encrypt the second node with the key that is stored in the first node and then it goes on. And then in, in this way, the whole data, whole linked list is encrypted. And you do it for all the keywords. And after that, you store the first uh, address, uh, first key to decrypt the first node in the special data structure. And uh, the elements of this data structure, that is an array, has a like, key, to the, key to decrypt the first node and pointer to the first node. And then now if you, uh, and for a keyword, so in this data structure, this corresponding element is stored in a position that is just like a hash of the keyword. So the array position where this element for, for, for a linked list needs to be stored is hash of the keyword. So you can later determine it again. So after that, all of these nodes are, uh, are randomly put it in a link, uh, in, a, in a big array, and then you do it for all the linked lists. And then 
pretty much this is the uh, two data structures that are sent to the server. Now later, if you want to do search, for example, for this keyword two, you just apply the same PRF two, and then you get the location in this data structure T. And if you get uh, uh, this location, this this contains the key to decrypt the first node and pointer to the first node, right? So from this, you can go to the you can decrypt the first node of the linked list. You just remove this lock, and then this node looks like this. It has document ID. So you recover the document ID of the first document. It has pointed to the next one and it has key to decrypt the next node. So from here, you can go to here and then you can now decrypt this node. And in the same way, you go on and you decrypt all the nodes. So this is how search works in this linked list based schemes. So I mean, if you, uh, uh, if you follow it, I mean, you can see that this means that it is sequential. Like You cannot paralyze it because in linked list, you decrypt the previous node with the key stored in the, uh, you, dec you dec decrypt the next node with the key stored in the previous node. So it cannot be parallelizable. Yeah, and uh, even uh, addition document, uh, adding document and de deletion is even more complicated. So now I'll explain blind story, yes. Do you expect the server to then re-encrypt the values after the uh, no. Just leave it in the clear. Yeah, it does not matter. I mean, you can just leave it in the clear because there were once the server knows it, then yeah, the leak already happened. Yeah, at some point you might want to do it again, but so uh, uh, we use a, a different technique to achieve blind, uh, searchable encryption that is based on blind storage. And so first we. Uh, so first, I'll, I'll talk about our blind storage scheme. So what blind storage should look like is something like this. So the client has a data structure that we call blind store. It's just a simple array. And then client has a bunch of files. And a client put all these files in using some uh, algorithm in this data structure. And then it encrypts <coughs> it in a clever way and send it to the cloud. Now, now, and and this just needs to guarantee these two things: that the total number of files are is not leaked to the server, and the size of the individual files are not leaked. And then later, when we want to access a file, what we do is we just uh, uh, we want to read the file. We have a file name. We just encrypt it using, uh, for example, just SHA-256 send it to the server, server will retrieve the file, encrypt it, send it back to the uh, client, the client can decrypt it, and if the client wants to update, client can update this file and in encrypt it again and send it back to the cloud. So this, uh, this way client can, like this is a general access, it can read, write, update, and delete in the same way. Now, scatter store is our protocol which we use to achieve. Yes. Does this uh, um, provide search functionality? Yes, yeah. I mean, uh, I'll explain later. We build search on top of it. Yeah. So, scatter store is our protocol uh, that we use to achieve blind storage. So, uh, we need to guarantee these two things that it should not leak the number of files initially indexed and it should not leak the file sizes of the files that are initially indexed. So our blind storage scheme is based on blocks. So our block format is something like this. So uh, we have header in every block and some, some space for data. So header has two things. One is the hash of the file ID. And the other thing is version. So version is used so every time we uh, re-encrypt the block, we use a different IV, so for that we keep track of this version. So we use a new nonce in the encryption scheme. And uh, the first block of a file is some is, is a little bit special, it just stores the number of blocks that's extra. Total number of blocks of a file is stored in the first block of the file. 
and if we have a file it is just passed into these blocks and then these blocks are stored in the blind storage. So how our schemes work is that if we have a blind, uh, so assume this is just a simple array, we call it blind store. Now client wants to store this file with file name one, it has just two blocks, I mean just for simplicity. Now if the client wants to store this file in this uh, blind storage, what it does is it first create a seed by just applying a hash function or NEPRF to the file name. It gets this seed and from this seeds it generate, it will pick some, uh, uh, it will ge generate a pseudo random sequence. So it will generate some random blocks from this blind store and then among these it can store its file in two of them like this. And now just two of them are marked occupied, rest are just free and later if the client wants to store another file, file name with file, uh, with, with file name, file name 2, it can just do the same process again, it, it get, it generate a seed and it randomly selects another, uh, 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 another set of blocks and now it can store it in the available blocks in those uh, that it selected randomly. And now these are mark occupied. This process, this this process goes on, and this uh, blind store is uh, slowly filled up. And uh, now, when later the client want to access the block, it is actually then uh, uh, encrypted. This thing is encrypted. Each block is encrypted separately, sent to the server, and now the server. Uh, uh, server has each block encrypted and now client wants to access it. For example, file name 2, it just generates the seed and with that seed it can figure out which blocks to retrieve and then it just retrieves all these blocks and now if the client wants to update these blocks, the client can update these blocks and write it back to the server in the same positions. So uh, uh, full access is a little bit tricky that uh, it has two rounds. Uh, in the first round, what we do is a similar, we just send the seed, but because we do not know the size of the file, in advance, we just download a fixed number of blocks, for example, two here. So we just download these two blocks in the first round. The first block, as I uh, showed you in the block format, contains the number of blocks. So we retrieve the number of blocks from the first block, once we have these number of blocks, we can do the second round. We just use the same seed to generate the rest of the pseudo random sequence. And we download remaining six blocks. And now the client uh, can uh, write back again if it wants to. So this is uh, how our blind story scheme works. Any questions? Just that we don't know how many files on your site. Yes. Okay, so, but you have to pay for it by, you know, your seed has to be expanded to the maximum file size and you have to... Uh, no. So, uh, uh, the pseudo random sequence that we need is, uh, I mean, we have different parameters, but uh, in, in our implementation, we use like four times the uh, blocks in the file. So if the file has four blocks, we select 16 blocks. Yeah, and the overhead is something like we need four times more storage also. Yeah, that is the whole tricky part in the protocol, how we reduce the, uh, the blow up in the storage. Yeah, that, yeah, we, uh, so, yeah, I, I, actually we have a detailed proof in the paper in which we uh, uh, show that if you do it in this way, the overhead is four, like very small. So if I have one file that has one byte and one file which is a terabyte? Yes, the, it will, yeah, there will be an issue. There. I mean, uh, so we do it like here, the first round in our protocol, the two blocks, I just use it for like ex explaining here. It's not two, it's like 80 blocks. 
So in the first round, we download 80 blocks always. So that take care of small files. So the probability that, uh, like for small files, you you will be able to find enough blocks. Yeah, but in the paper we do prove that like this probability is something like two to the power minus forty, or two to the power minus eight. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So the probability that you select uh, 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 blocks for a file and the probability that you are not able to uh, write your file in these blocks because they were already occupied is negligible. Yeah, so that is why like why we are reading more is actually just because of this that for example if you have uh, if you just select two blocks to write your file then uh, 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 then it's like the first file is good but when you want to write your second file now the problem is that if you select randomly these blocks the probability of overlap with with the block that is already occupied is non negligible and if you just select two then you need to select another block to write your file and then it does leak the fact that there is one file that is already present uh, there is one file that is al already present in the cloud, in the in the storage. So we do not want to reveal this also. So one one thing that more that we require is that accessing single file should not leak anything about the other files. So now I'll explain how we. Uh, build our SSE scheme on top of blind storage. So we again have the setup phase. So what we have is we have our, our blind store and then we have a set of documents. We uh, create an index, uh, uh, just simple inverted index. And each, each of the, uh, uh, so we considered like this list for each uh, keyword as as a file in our blind storage. So we create file for each keyword. So this is like file with contents one and two. And we create with uh, this for all the file, all, all the keywords. And then we store this in, in the blind storage. Then we uh, encrypt this using the blind storage scheme that I uh, explained. And we encrypt the documents using simple AES. We send both to the cloud. And now when we want to do the search, what we do is that we send this encrypted token to the uh, server. It has this, uh, it just looks up in the blind storage and will give us the file. Using the same strategy for the blind storage, it will give us this file that is actually the list of document IDs that contain this keyword. We retrieve this file and the client can now decrypt the file and it can read the document IDs that contain that keyword. Now the client needs to send this document IDs back to the server and the uh, server can uh, uh, pick the file two and three and send it back to the client. Client can just decrypt the keys. And now at this stage, we need to write back this file and we call and we and we need it for lazy delete that I'll explain later. But uh, uh, every time for every search, we need to write it back. So uh, we have this another storage that we call clear store. So yes. Can go back to yes. Slide. So here, um, when the data is stored, when it's at rest, the cloud doesn't know the sizes and the number of the files, but as soon as I access a particular keyword, the server can see how many blocks, yes. uh, you know, how many iterations of the protocol um, yes. are used. So you can see if the list of documents is very long or very short, and the amount. Yeah, you know, that. Linguistic attacks. Or, yeah, uh, 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 that is allowed to leak in searchable encryption schemes. Yeah, that is uh, the allowed leakage. Like we define this leakage, uh, we allow this. I mean, this is uh, this is the reason why all searchable encryption schemes are efficient. That you do leak something. 
we leak this thing. So when you search, you leak uh, uh, this access pattern that uh, which documents contain which encrypted keywords and you also leak that if you are searching for the same keyword again repeatedly. Yeah, somehow we'll do it again. Okay. So now, oh, I had the, uh, so uh, we need clear store because as I explained uh, earlier in searchable encryption schemes, when you add document, the hashes of all the keywords are already leaked to the server. So we don't need to put it in our blind storage scheme. If we do put it in our blind storage scheme, it's very expensive. But uh, uh, so for that reason, we have this another uh, uh, store, a clear store, that uh, uh, so new files that we update files, then when, when we add files that are stored in clear store and not in the blind storage. So it stores the files unencrypted because for example, whenever you add a document, then you know which keywords it links to. Because you added a document in your uh, blind storage system and you also need to update the index files for the keywords that this document contains. So that information is leaked to the server anyway. So we do not need to use blind storage to protect that. So, uh, for so, so you, you, you're leaking the relation to the file and the PRF evaluation of the keywords, right? Yes. Keywords. Yeah. So, so that's what we leak. Right. So your clear store isn't storing the documents themselves. No, no, no. It's still storing encryption of the documents. Or so this clear store is just, it stored the index files. So for example, uh, what it will store unencrypted is like the keyword and then which document IDs it maps to. In blind storage, we need to encrypt these and use it in the clever way. Okay. Sure. Because it is leaked anyway. Sure, but so what exactly is, is stored unencrypted in clear store? It's the yes, keywords? is the document IDs, oh, not document the keywords. IDs. Okay. Sure. The document IDs are, uh, so, uh, uh, keywords are still like you need to do this PRF evaluation. Yeah, yeah, but the document IDs are stored un unencrypted because uh, they, uh, so we don't know, we do not need to pay the overhead of blind storage. Uh, actually, one limitation we can use blind storage, but the problem is that uh, we want that the server do not do any operations. If the server can support append operation, then we can like just it can just append something to a file. And then we can just append, like when, whenever we add, we can just send to the server and it can append it. Yeah, so, so it supports the like constant time append operation. That is like, uh, if you have a file, you can just add, uh, if you can append something to the file. And uh, because uh, uh, many cloud APIs do not support the append operation, we implement it by just downloading small number of blocks and uploading small number of blocks. So uh, like uh, if we have this document list, we just download the last block. And if it is uh, full, we download one more block. And we need to download the first block also. So we just need to download three blocks and upload then just two of them. So now whenever we need to add a document, what we need to do is uh, we have this document and then we just extract keys, uh, keywords. And all the keywords and now we encrypt the document with the uh, simple encryption scheme and that is like AES and then we encrypt these keywords using like uh, SHA-256 and then we send these keywords in the file. The file is, uh, uh, then for all these keywords we will get uh, these files uh, that is actually the index that corresponds to this keyword. That is like the list of documents that contain this keyword. And like just as, as I explained earlier, these are just like this is not the complete index that we download. We just download three blocks every time and upload two blocks. 
So like they are downloaded all these files, the client can just update it, like add the document ID and then uh, uh, send it back to the server. So uh, delete is free in our scheme. Uh, we, so what we need to do is if the client wants to delete a document, to just send the document ID to the server and the server will just delete like for example if this is the file that needs to be deleted server will just delete it from here and that's it that's what we need to do for delete so it's pretty much free like you just need one operation to delete the file from the file system but then we need this lazy delete strategy using search time for example when you search for a keyword you get this you get this file and at this point if you uh, uh, when you send these document IDs to the server and at, and at this point you see that file 3 does not exist, it will be uh, the server can tell uh, to the client that this file does not exist and now the client can just update these document IDs to 2 and then send it back to the server. So this is how we handle lazy delete and so this reduces leakage also when we delete a file we do not leak anything but when slowly when we start searching then we just reveal the fact that this keyword that, is, that has been just searched for is present was present in that file that was deleted so, so uh, we do leak access pattern and search pattern and just like uh, all prior SSE schemes and uh, so we leak nothing when the file is deleted. At that time, we leak nothing. But slowly, when, when, when we start searching for the keywords that were present in the file that was deleted, we leak the fact that these keywords were present in that file. But it is gradually, like if client does never search for the keyword that was present in the document that was deleted, uh, the information is not leaked. So. For the updates, our scheme leaks strictly less than all prior schemes, except uh, this uh, Stefanov et al. NDSS 2014 scheme that, that uh, achieve a stronger no, uh, privacy notion, but uh, they need to pay log, log cube overhead on top of our scheme. So now I'll explain uh, uh, some of the features of our uh, using uh, blind storage to implement searchable encryption. So the first is that our scheme as, as you have seen is very simple and it's very efficient. So it is dynamic and still the whole scheme is very simple. And the other advantage we have is that we have a computation free server which means that uh, all prior schemes need some kind of processing to be done on the cloud. and then they need some storage services. So, and what we need is that our scheme just works with any computation uh, uh, free server, like this can be Dropbox. So we, uh, the, the interface that we need from the server is just upload blocks and download blocks. So why, why is it important like this fact uh, that we do not, uh, uh, that we do not need any computation on, on, on the server is that, uh, First, it can work with any cloud storage service like Dropbox or Google Drive. <coughs> and cl cloud storage is more widely used by like normal users. Maybe enterprises uses compute cloud also, but, and uh, so there is bandwidth cost. Like for example, if you use Amazon EC2 and Dropbox, then you need to pay for bandwidth cost between them. And also there is latency issues are, uh, well known in cloud services even even if you use amazon s3 and ec2 they are in the same so in the same data centers they are separated like uh, if you need to get data from e, uh, s3 amazon s3 you need to go through data center network and this uh, will include some lot of delay so other features of our uh, SSE scheme is that it supports compression. We can compress the files in the blind storage. So if the index files are like not random, then uh, we can reduce the size of the index. 
so we just put the index in the blind storage at the like another way is that we can put all of our documents also in the blind storage and then we do not reveal information about documents also and it is inherently parallel like because we just need to uh, do this decryption on blocks that can be just parallelized very easily we leak less and uh, we just our security just depend upon like standard assumptions that are like PRF assumption and security of PRF and hash functions and our delete is like just uh, zero cost we do not pay anything for delete so now I'll uh, talk about the performance of our scheme so if I mean if our scheme is used cleverly it will just cost like four times uh, four times AES cost to, in, to encrypt the index this is not always true you need to like use it cleverly so this is the processing co uh, costs this is so the previous best scheme it took like 15 hours to process 16 gigabytes of data this is just a searchable encryption cost excluding the time it takes to gen generate the plain text index and our scheme just take uh, uh, 41 minutes uh, uh, to do to process the same amount same amount of data so uh, we evaluated our scheme on uh, Enron dataset and you can see that search is also uh, uh, this is pre-processing so we ran the experiments to tell like 256 megabyte of data and it's pretty fast it just like take like 35 seconds to encrypt to encrypt 256 megabyte of data using our searchable encryption scheme and search is also very fast like in like so here we searched for the most frequent keyword that is like D so we search for the word D which pretty much which which pretty much means that you need to download everything because uh, it's present in almost all the emails and for that it's like we just paid for example like half a second half a second uh, for 256 megabyte of data and to add files uh, we added files of different sizes so a file with uh, 4000 keywords takes something like quarter second to uh, add to our blind storage scheme and then we also evaluated our scheme on the document data set so the documents are like doc pdf xls that are not like that are like rich text so there was no data set av available so we just collected one gigabyte documents uh, from google by and then we just filtered them for just like english documents because there were other languages also and then the pre-processing for it is like for one gigabyte document we just need to pay something like 30 seconds and uh, search is also very fast for one gigabyte something like seven millisecond to search for the keyword D and adding we added like 20, 27 megabyte PDF file with 10,000 keywords and it also takes something like 600 milliseconds yeah. and delete is free because of our lazy daily strategy and the search uh, performance that I showed it it includes the search overhead that we pay for delete at search time so in conclusion i would like to say that the, we have identified a more basic primitive that is like the blind storage scheme uh, it might have some other applications uh, the whole scheme is simpler it's more scalable and secure i mean uh, we also believe it's more practical because it does not need any server-side computation the only and we can just deploy it on Dropbox or any cloud storage service uh, with just using the API that they provide now and for the same and and as it's very simple it's very easy to write code for it it's very easy to deploy and it can be used uh, it can be deployed on any commercial uh, cloud storage service like Dropbox so I have written a uh, Dropbox interface for C++ so I mean we can just use that to store uh, files in the Dropbox 
Yeah, if you have any questions. Yeah. yeah, so can you so your scheme has one round when you download a fixed number of blocks, right? And that tells you kind of the next yes. blocks that you need to download. Can you just get rid of that extra round that first round? So, so um, we cannot like get rid of it completely, but with parameters, if you set your parameters uh, cleverly, uh, most of the time it will be one round, but for very large files it might be more rounds. Yeah, or two rounds, because... Even for large rounds, can you just do something where it's uh, part of your token that allows you to open up, to find and open up those blocks, and that gives you the server where basically the information that, that it would get. So the purpose of the first round is to sort of uh, the client gets back his blocks, opens them up locally, and, fit, and then sends back the address of the new blocks from the server. So yeah. Like yeah. So, so so if we can say if by just somehow giving the information to the server again, sort of get the information itself. From the yeah. If we can, like, I mean, one way, one trivial way of doing it is just like storing the size locally, which is. Very small. Well, yeah, yeah. No, no, you want to do that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Other way is like, I mean, if we allow the. So actually, one problem is that we don't allow server to do any computation. Oh, yeah. Right. So that is, so yeah, yeah, that is a problem. Yeah. So then, yeah, then. Yeah. If you do allow the computation, you should be able to get rid of the extra Yeah, then what we can do is we can give just, just a seat to the server. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? So do you think, like, have you, um, so what's the largest data set that you use? So it was the, the end round? Uh, 256 megabyte 256 and under. Megabyte. And so how do you think this would? Uh, Scale? Yeah, so like the, the IBM scheme, right, they ran it on like half a terabyte? Yes. You, so I tried to run it on the, bigger data set but the problem is that so I have implemented it in in memory I mean like we just store everything in memory uh, yeah for like one of the reason was to compare it with your scheme because uh, yeah so that's why we store it in memory so I try to run it on Wikipedia but so we have a machine with 128 GB memory but it was not working yeah so uh, all these comparisons that I showed you was done on my laptop. Uh, yeah. I mean, so the problem also with this scheme is, you can, so it's, it's paralyzable, but it won't be really, it won't be IO, um, IO efficient, right? Because of the random access. So we need more blocks, that's why? So, yeah, so you're going to be hitting, like, I mean, if, if you do store, let's say, the, the index on this, right, you, um, the way you're accessing the blind store, like let's say the blind store is on, sorry, the way you're accessing mm -hmm. it is like it's a random location, it's a random location. Yeah. Right? So you won't be able to take advantage of like memory hierarchy or something like that. Right? So like True. Or, so on big actually it's on half a terabyte data set, you're gonna get I mean it's gonna be a pretty big overhead just to the IO operations. I see. You mean just the disk overhead because yeah. sequential access is... Well, it's, uh, yeah, and it, it's random. I mean, it's, yes. I'm just point where it's, like, it's random. If it was sequential, you would do better, right? Because this would just give you blocks, just entire blocks at once. But here it's going to be worse. But isn't that mm -hmm. I.O. going to be kind of dwarfed by the I.O. of retrieving the whole file? Because you're going to get like, I don't know, 16 blocks out of that. Depends how store. big the files are. So the, you know, the entire data set can be huge. Files. So I guess maybe yeah, with many small files. It may not be that big, yeah. In that case, the overhead would show yeah. up. Yeah. So it may yeah. not be both, but. Yeah. So for many small files, we have a problem. Huh? We have overhead also, but but if we have uh, so one thing we can do is like, if we really want to store like very large data set, we can in increase the block size. Uh, such that we compensate for yeah. the yeah yeah, so, yeah. Well. so if we can increase the block size then we can compensate for that uh, yeah storing.
So how big was the uh, index for your 256? Yeah, it's something like 180 megabytes. 180 megabytes. Yeah. So, so that is one of the questions. Like, I mean, we cannot store index locally because it is almost the date. So why? So why was it so big? Because uh, every document ID in the implementation is uh, four bytes, just like in, in an integer. So then that uh, there are so many keywords in end on data set that uh, it takes that much space. So that depends upon how much keyword pairs you have. So keyword pair is like keyword file pairs. So you need one integer, four byte integer for every key, uh, keyword file pair. Because you have this keyword and then you need to store uh, a document ID of every file that, that contains this keyword. So you can also like um, trying to um, sort of augment this with the OXT thing from the loading queries. Oh, uh, uh, have you thought about whether this you can just reuse the stuff in the other paper? We didn't think about it carefully, but we uh, but we are just like uh, uh, we believe that it will work. Like I mean, this scheme we if we can adapt this scheme to their setting also. Yeah. And also to the and, and also to the multi-user setting, where they have uh, so there is uh, one data owner, but I mean so here the like this scheme or most searchable encry encryption schemes, they have just one user like he stores data and then he later he searches it, but I mean they have this other model in which you have one data owner, but then he allows multiple people to search over the data. So we hope we can also extend it to that. I mean, like it, it can be extended to that, but with uh, carefully. So, yeah. so one, um, I guess one thing you didn't talk about was uh, security definitions. Um, and so like, you know, kind of adaptive security. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we achieve adaptive security, yeah. Um, so, but actually, so the, so I forget the details, but like you, you encrypt it in the blind storage, right? The data is, is encrypted using any encryption scheme or a non committed or like some form of a non Oh, okay, no, yes. it's interactive. It's interactive. So yeah, we, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so we need, yeah, so that's, so we yeah. Get around yeah, we around get with, with this interaction. interaction sure. But like, I mean. Uh, that would be another problem if you did an uninteractive version. Yeah. You wouldn't be able to just use regular encryption. You have to use something that's, that's not encrypted. Yes. So, so from the start, we want to have some interaction to achieve adaptive security. Yeah. yeah I mean that, like then uh, in. So, like if we believe that the scheme that we have is like uh, if you if you pick these uh, the the number of blocks that need to be downloaded in the first round cleverly, then. It for the most time, for the most of the time, it will be uh, one round. Yeah. But like it is two rounds. Yeah. Back to the index size. Did you experiment with like throwing away the most common words? Like the, uh, the, the, the yeah. Words? If we yeah we did not because. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, we wanted to compare with other schemes, so we did not uh, like we just tokenize it simply, like just using space. Yeah, that's why that's it's big. What the other literature does. I think so. Okay. Yeah. Because that's kind of I don't think anyone implements indices like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can just get rid of like numbers, symbols, and yeah. Yeah, I mean that is one of the uh, issue with this is that we include headers also, because I mean. Uh, uh, we cannot compare with other schemes if we do not do that. So, but the headers like take up, like email headers. So if you just include that, it like, they have too much, uh, like unique, unique keywords. Tokens. Yes. So if you like just remove it, I mean this is so um, the searchable encryption can be very efficient. For example, uh, if you want to store health record, and the only thing you care about is like diagnosis code. 
you just want to search for like some diag so diagnosis code is like for each disease have some code so if you just want to search for that then you don't you just throw away all the data and you just put that like in the index so in that case could you just download the index Figure out which you need locally and you uh, maybe. Yeah. That's one thing. Uh, so my advisor is uh, giving this as an assignment to undergrad students to do this thing, to see how much uh, local index is and how much locally affects. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.